The Holy Gospel according to the fourth chapter of Matthew. Glory to you, O Lord. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And he fasted forty days and forty nights, and afterwards he was hungry. And the tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, Throw yourself down, for it is written, He will give his angels charge of you, and on their hands will they bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, Again it is written, You shall not tempt the Lord your God. Again the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. And he said to him, All these I will give you if you fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and ministered to him. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to God. Praise to you, o Christ. Let us pray. Gracious Father, we do give you thanks for the power of your word and for the power of your spirit bringing us here today. And we pray now that you would open our hearts and minds to receive that word of yours and then by that same spirit give us strength to do it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Well, so it begins. Happy Lent, everyone! Yeah, is that kind of like an oxymoron to say that? I mean, what is happy about Lent? Uh, we do some work with the youth group, and uh, when we go on trips and, uh, you know, service projects and that, we'll end the, the time together usually doing this thing called high-low. You know, what was the high of the trip or what was the low of the trip? Well, now it's our turn. Because last week, we had a mountaintop high, did we not, with the transfiguration? And now, this week, we got a valley, desert, wilderness low. We got the temptation of Christ, the story of original sin. Just a few days ago, we gathered and we were marked with ashes on our forehead, being reminded that we are dust and to dust we shall return. Can we get any lower? I mean, if you've been around me for a while, um, it's about this time of year that this phrase kind of slips out of my mouth, and that is, wake me up when Easter's over. Not because we don't get to say the A word, you know, the hallelujahs. Not because the church schedule gets a little busier with all the extra worship services. I mean, at least we don't have, you know, Christmas shopping to do and decorating. But we do have this whole weird, uh, you know, Lenten sacrifice thing going on. You know, hopefully you got that video from uh, Pastor Johnson describing those 13 possible, you know, they're just some of many disciplines that you can do this Lent. I've got my little pinky finger done with fingernail polish. Um, but uh, how is your Lenten discipline going? Is it better than your New Year's resolution? You know? But I say, wake me up when Easter is over so I can get my happy back on. You know, I want my happy back on. I say it because Lent is this time where we seem to be even more focused on sin and the effects of it in our lives. It's like sin on steroids, where we become even more intentional on looking at ourselves in the mirror, examining our lives and our heart and, and our faith. But seriously, without recognizing our sinful nature and, and what Christ has done for us, what would be the point in gathering here today? I mean, would we just come to gather to hear what pathetic human beings we are? That'd be really a big downer, I think, you know? But we gather because somehow, somewhere, someone would gather up all of our patheticness and save us from ourselves. Lent isn't about just focusing in 
on our sin, but focusing on our Savior. As Paul puts it today, that one man, Jesus, and what he came to do and what he is preparing to do for us. So we gather here to be nourished and fed, to give thanks to God for the work of his son and to be reminded of our identity in Christ and his identity in the Father. To look in that mirror and not just see our sin, but to see us for who God sees us as and to even be ministered to by God. When it comes to the lessons today, it would be easy to sum it up in something like, Jesus was tempted, he overcame all the temptations, therefore you can too, just imitate him, you'll be all right. I could give you like 10 easy steps on how to deal with temptation, you know? Start counting backwards from 100, or if it's a really big temptation, start counting backwards from 1,000, you know, by the time you get to one, maybe that temptation will be gone. While all of that is good stuff, it's, it's not quite where the Spirit was leading me to focus today. That is a sermon for another day. We always know there's always another sermon to be preached. Yes, temptation is very real to us. It was real to Adam and Eve. It was real to Jesus. We, we just read it in the scriptures. Instead, I want to focus on how our identity is revealed in how we deal with temptation how Christ dealt with temptation and his time in the wilderness identifies him. So let's start with Christ. Always a good place to start. The uh, reading of the gospel today comes just on the heels of uh, God declaring, This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Which takes place, do you remember where that was? The baptism uh, of, of Jesus at the Jordan by John. And now is the time for Jesus to reveal who he is. The Spirit leads him into the wilderness to prepare for the road that he is about to travel, where he fasted and prayed for 40 days and 40 nights, and Lord, he was hungry. And that tempter comes and says, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become bread. I know you're hungry. If you are really the Son of God, you have the power to fix this. Save yourself, Jesus. But Jesus said, no. Man shall not eat by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Jesus is quoting Deuteronomy. The account of Moses and the Israelites, that whole 40 years in the wilderness thing, you know, where God provided for them, you know, the cloud, of, uh, cloud by day, fire by night, the uh, water from the rock, the manna from the sky. God's word is so powerful, it can create something out of nothing. Let me tell you a little tempter. God, my Father, has provided since he created he has spoken his promises to his people, and to me, he has sent me here for a purpose. Obedience to my Father is more important than the comfort of my own hunger pains. Creation itself is hungering and thirsting, and for that, I have been sent. Can we get a scorecard out here? You know, here we go. Jesus won, tempter zero, okay? So the word has power, you say, eh? Yeah, the devil, the tempter, you know, comes and uses the word itself to his advantage. And there at the high point, the pinnacle, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down. You know what the word says. God's going to catch you and protect you. The problem is the devil is challenging Jesus in his relationship with the father. I mean, really, what father would not do anything in his power to save his son unless God had a purpose for his son that would restore the entire world to him? Was God there to serve Jesus? Or was Jesus there to serve God's divine purpose? Do not tempt God. Remember that scorecard? 
Yeah, it's today. Jesus, two. Tempter, zero. And finally, we have that third temptation. The devil takes him to the mountaintop and shows him all the kingdoms of the world. Pretty, pretty, you know. And all the glory of them. I mean, how awesome. All these things I will give you if you fall down and worship me. If you are the son of God, I mean, it's all yours anyway, right? Oh, little tempter. Kingdoms. You want to talk about some kingdoms? My kingdom is not from this world. Jesus came not to rule Satan's kingdom, but to proclaim God's kingdom and to bring in the reign of God. Scorecard, Jesus 3, tempter 0. Can you picture God now? I mean, if he wasn't pleased before, you know, at that whole baptism thing, I mean, he must be super duper pleased now. Even sending his angels to minister to Jesus. The reality is, in any of this, Jesus could have taken the easy road, but he had a path. He had a cross to bear. We know Lent leads us to this message of hope and salvation. We know that in this life we have crosses to bear and, and we will experience wilderness journeys. Yet in the end, we will be rejoicing. After the resurrection, Jesus will receive all authority in heaven and on earth. And until that time, he has a road to travel, a journey to take. And we know even he struggled with that at times. Father, if this cup be taken from me. Yet his obedience to the Father is unwavering. In the temptations, Jesus' identity as the Son of God is absolutely revealed. So what does our identity have to say about how we deal with temptations? I think it's really ironic that the lectionary people put this Old Testament lesson with this gospel reading today. Because while the gospel lesson reveals Jesus' identity, that Old Testament, it kind of oozes ours. We've got that whole Adam and Eve story going on. We're pretty familiar with that. God created and it was good. He provided everything that they needed for the fulfillment of life. And God gave Adam and Eve all freedom except one limit. One restriction. You can have anything you want except that. The serpent, that crafty one, begins his work, and it is so subtle. You know, he challenges God's very word. You know, that powerful word of God. You won't die. Did, did God really say that? Can you picture the conversation between Adam and Eve? Die? Die. Do you know anything about dying? I don't know anything about dying. I only know about living. Yeah. I mean, what would be wrong about knowing the difference between good and evil? Would that not be helpful to know? Would it not make our lives just a little easier if we knew that? And so it went. They consumed. And Adam and Eve knew immediately that they had sinned did what was contrary to the will of God. The paradise of the garden, as they knew it, had ended. This is what we affectionately know as original sin, where we are born now into this fallen humanity. The wages of sin is now death. And this sin works in our lives every single day, to know what we should do, and that is the will of God, but not having the ability or the strength to do it. To have and know the word of God, yet we'll reason away our situation or justify our actions. I mean, I really don't need to forgive them because, you know, they did this. I don't really need to care about them because, well, you know, I don't know, they're not like me or they're just whatever it is. I mean, just because we know something is good doesn't mean we use it for good. Knowing how to use your computer is absolutely a good thing. It's a great tool for the ministry. Unless you start using that gift, I don't know, to hack computers. We become like our own God, not like the God. We determine for ourselves what is good and evil. 
We also like to violate our limits, don't we? I mean, I think that started to show itself when we were about two years old, you know? We want what we can't have, or if someone else has it, we certainly want it. Now, we're a pretty good looking group here today, so I don't think any of us woke up this morning and said, today I'm just gonna be mean and evil. No, most of the time, we hear ourselves say something like, I didn't mean to do that, or I got caught up in the moment, or even I didn't think it would hurt them. Sin exposes who we are. Like Adam and Eve, their eyes were open, and they saw that they were naked and exposed, and we become exposed. And who of us likes to focus on that? Focus on our brokenness or our failure to live faithfully as his son's disciples. No, we prefer to hide ourselves. But Lord, where do we go? To whom shall we go? This is one of the gifts and blessings we receive in Lent. We study the word. We spend time in prayer and fasting and, and self-examination and all of our Lenten disciplines. And it helps us see our need for God's amazing grace. There's this one that Paul talks about. The wages of sin is death, but there is this one person's obedience that redeems us. Today, our focus is on God's redeeming son and his kingdom, that one person who has begun his reign, that one person who comes to take away the sin of the world, that one person who is God made flesh. Yes, he is the son of God. He doesn't need to make bread because he will become the bread, the bread of life. He doesn't need to worry about hitting his foot on a stone because he's so powerful, he's gonna roll the stone away as he ascends to the Father and sits at his right hand. He doesn't need or want or desire kingdoms because his kingdom, his reign, is eternal. Sin is always working to separate us from the Father. And we pray, Lord, lead us not into temptation. And when it does, deliver us from evil. We pray as the Father has taught us, and we put on Christ, we resist the devil, and he will flee from us. Christ is the victor. He battled the temptations and sin, death, the devil, and all of his empty promises on our behalf. If you are the son of God, prove it. Ah, he knows who he is because of whose he is. And today, it has been proven to us. It will be proven in the breaking of the bread. It was proven in the declaration of the forgiveness of your sins. It is proven in a community that gathers to share the peace of Christ with one another. It is proven in the Spirit's work in each of us, bringing us here today to be ministered to by God and to be strengthened for the work that will be before each of us this week. Wake me up when Easter is over is, is well, it's only the glory part of that. It's only the glory part of the journey we are on. It is necessary that the Son of God be betrayed, suffer, and die, but on that third day, he will rise again. The gift, and yes, even the joy of Lent, is that he walks with us these 40 days. He walks with us all the days of our lives, guarding and protecting us, teaching us the will of the Father and ways of discipleship. We take on these odd Lenten disciplines to help us develop habits of faith, if you will, to keep us faithful in the weary and tempting times, to be reminded that our identity as a child of God is only possible because Jesus faithfully responded to his identity as the Son of God. His faithfulness allows us to see ourselves in the light of God's grace, a grace freely given to us in the midst of all of our failing efforts and attempts, 
exposing the shadows of who we are, but claiming us for whose we are. And in thanksgiving, we worship and serve only him. People of God, can I get a Lenten happy amen? Amen. amen? amen. Thanks be to God. We'll take a few moments to meditate on the word and the will of God. 